Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Alex Reeb. I'm, uh, I'm an instruction system specialist here at the K9 Training Center, San Antonio, Texas. Just a little brief background. I got my start in dogs when I was about 19, and that's about 20 years ago. I was a, I was a military working dog handler in the United States Marine Corps. Um, I knocked out two combat deployments as a handler to, uh, to Iraq. I enjoyed working dogs in the operational environment so much, I went ahead and took a one-year contract to Afghanistan after I got out of the military just because Dr. Otto touched on it. There's no job better than working a dog. You can't beat it. I'm, I've been doing it since I was a kid. Um, <clears throat> but then moving forward, I got into a position where I got to be an instructor, and that's actually uh, – I was a regional canine instructor when I came on with TSA. That's how I met Andy back in – Andy, what, 2012? Little Rock, Some, whatever that was. Yeah, I was stationed in Little Rock, Arkansas. And if you're from Arkansas, that's that's good for you. I'm from Texas. It wasn't great for me. But um, – no, uh, I got the opportunity to come back down to San Antonio as an instructor, took advantage of that. Uh, training dogs is my passion. And following Dr. Otto is super intimidating, so you guys just bear with me. Let's go ahead and go to the uh, the next slide, please. So there's a pretty picture of the building where I work. It's down here in San Antonio, like I said, on Lackland Air Force Base. It's a pretty big facility. We've only been in here for about four or five years. We do have seven classrooms. We have space for 95 employees. The really cool part about that is we have 126 employees. So my, most government things we've gotten a little big for our britches down here. Uh, we do have a large auditorium. We do have kennels and those two that they say are in construction actually just got finished. So we can house up to 300 dogs uh, in any in any phase of training while they're down here at the Canine Training Center. Um, we've got 17 indoor venues that replicate varying types of transportation systems, right? We've got rail cars, light, light and heavy, and the difference is uh, only homeless people sleep on light rail. That's a joke. Light rail is like your subway, your L train. Uh, they're your regular commuter trains. Heavy rails are going to be your Amtrak with the sleeping and the and the uh, the eating cars and the dining cars and whatnot. We we actually have simulated aircraft. Some of them have first class and uh, economy seating. We've got a simulated wide body that would be an international flight. We've got simulated luggage areas. Uh, you name it, we've got two simulated terminals. We've got all kinds of areas down here just trying to expose the dogs environmentally to as many different things, making sure we've got the best candidate working out there in the operational environment. Andy's going to talk about that operational stuff. That's not what I'm all about. So we're going to talk about trainer essentials, right? Dr. Otto talked about how amazing these dogs are. I'm going to talk about how we trick them into doing what we want them to do. And uh, I'm an education major. I, I got my, both of my degrees are in education. And like you guys, if you understand early childhood education, you can train a dog because training a kid is like training a dog. In fact, I would say dogs are a little bit easier because they don't talk back, right? But the three essentials you need when training a dog are knowledge, patience, and practice. And when I say knowledge, I mean you have to have an understanding of the principles of conditioning, the science behind manipulating that behavior, and what drives the behavior you're trying to manipulate. Patience, obviously. Like I said, dogs don't talk back. That means they don't speak our language. Right, So it obviously requires a large amount of patience to get on a level where you can communicate effectively with this dog and tell them what it is you're looking for and practice. Once you figure out what it is, the key to good training, any program, no matter what it is, is consistency. So when I say drive, it's, it's, an, it's a set of instinctual behaviors that exist solely to satisfy a canine's basic need. And canine's basic needs are really, really simple. They are food, water, socialization, and air. That's it. That's all a dog really needs to survive, right? but they're going to perform certain behaviors that we can manipulate, hunting and eating, right? Has anybody, they're not Garfield the cat. We've never had a dog say, oh, well, I'm not going to eat this because it's not lasagna. I mean, we've all seen dogs eat garbage, right? They're not the most, uh, they don't have the most discerning taste, but they will eat because it's a basic need. Um, hunting is a basic need and that behavior is instinctual and it lives to satisfy their prey drive or the willingness to chase and find their own food, carry, bite, kill, and eat. And when we're training, we activate these drives with simulated prey items. We use a lot of tennis balls. Dr. Otto said food. I love food reward. It's very, very powerful. It touches the dog on a basic, basic level. Um, and we're going to get into that when we talk about classical conditioning. While we're manipulating these dogs' basic drives to get the desired behavior, we have to make sure that they still satisfy one of the key primary needs. Most importantly, or most valuable is what we try to use as food, either simulated or real. So everybody knows these names, Pavlov's and Skinner, right? Pavlov and Skinner, we're going to talk about basic conditioning. Well, the psychology for people and dogs is exactly the same. You know, Pavlov, he, he discovered or, or explained to us in simple terms, classical conditioning, 
right? And we all know what classical conditioning is. It's 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 a association of two unrelated stimuli that then eventually elicits a conditioned behavior, right? But Skinner went on to really go into detail and talk about those operant behaviors, making choices, shaping behavior with the use of a reinforcer or a punisher, right? And reinforcement exists in both models. It's just the, the control, who controls the reinforcement and where that reinforcement's coming from. Behavior is going to be changed in the environment, either by the events surrounding the reinforcement or the stimuli associated with the reinforcement. So that's why we have to be very careful and very consistent. That ties back into that practice. In Dr. Otto's video, you heard the beep. The beep tells the dog, hey, you're correct. You got it. That dog knows when I hear this beep, it's chow time. I'm coming to get my food because I did exactly what mom or dad asked me to do. So that's the association we're looking for. And that positive reinforcement is tied into that reinforcer, the food, which ties back to that basic need or drive, right? And when we're conditioning these behaviors, we're looking to condition either two types of behaviors. Respondent are those behaviors that are most naturally classically conditioned because respondent behaviors are like a reflex for a better term. And operant behaviors is everything else. If it's operant, we had to make a choice right? Okay, so there we have Pavlov's model, right? And in, in slide one, we're looking at the presentation of the food. And when Pavlov's got all these, these well, psychology has given us all these really cool terms, right? Like unconditioned stimulus. Well, food for a dog is an unconditioned stimulus. That means that anytime you show a dog food, they're going to drool. They will salivate. They will prepare to ingest that food. I've got a Neapolitan Mastiff Rescue at my house. She's hideous and she drools a lot, especially when presented with food. Doesn't mean I don't love her. In fact, she's probably my favorite. Don't tell the other dogs. But when presented with food, she drools. Now, Pavlov realized that this was happening and he didn't have to do anything to elicit the response. So then he introduced the bell and the bell in this model is called a neutral stimulus. That means it doesn't mean anything. Initially, the dog sat there and was unimpressed by the bell. And I'm sure Dr. Otto will tell you, initially when they started beeping that tone, unless it was immediately paired with food, the dogs weren't paying that much attention. Right. And in that phase of training, we call that loading or shaping, chaining. There's a bunch of different terms, but eventually, essentially, it's the clear association of this stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus, right? The neutral stimulus that means nothing and the unconditioned stimulus that makes something happen just because the dog knows it's, it's awesome. And through that consistent pairing, what we get is the creation of a conditioned stimulus and a conditioned response. Conditioned is just a really... It's, it's several steps above training, right? Like let's, don't get the, the, if your dog is trained, that's great. That means they're gonna respond to commands and there'll be some consistency there. But if your dog is truly conditioned to a behavior, that means they have lost the ability to choose not to respond, right? Because through successful association and pairing, this dog now fully believes in Pavlov's model that every time the bell rings, it's going to be accompanied by food. So then what, what used to happen naturally with food has now been replaced by the bell. A completely unnatural stimulus that, mean, that meant nothing through association has taken on the powerful meaning of what the dog is expecting as a reinforcement. Okay, and that's classical conditioning in a very small nutshell. Okay, so then we get into operant conditioning, and this is B.F. Skinner's realm. And B.F. Skinner's got all kinds of, the difference between Pavlov and Skinner is that they had video cameras, and there are super cool videos about Skinner. There's a TED Talk called The Crow Vending Machine. Watch it. It's amazing. They talk about the, the powerful use of a reinforcer for behavior, associated behavior, right? So we have to start with a stimulus discriminative. That is whatever the target stimulus is. In detection, we start with, well, here at the TSA, we start with an explosive odor right? We introduce the dog with an explosive odor and we're looking for a desired response. So through obedience training, we've already shaped a passive sit or we look for that freeze like Dr. Otto has with her dogs. And then all we have to do is continually and consistently pair that stimulus discriminative with the desired response with a timely reinforcement, right? The model is extremely simple. Once you get what you want, you pay that dog. That's all it is. You show them what you're going to have them look for. You associate it with the reinforcement, and then you just repeat, rinse and repeat. It's like shampoo, head and shoulders, all the time, rinse and repeat. And for environmental purposes, you're going to expose your dog to a lot of different venues so the dog can get used to working and get past some of that uh, context and, and, and uh, generalization, the situation surrounding how the dog was taught. Eventually, when you put it all together, we get what we call instrumental conditioning, 
our dogs are, we have a, well, we have two types of dogs, two types of final responses. We have what's called a sit, stay, pay and a focus. Focus dogs, it's at that, at, at the end of the day, it's all personal preference. Both of them know that uh, the magician doesn't really have a rabbit in his hat, but the focus dogs tend to believe in Santa Claus a little bit longer than your sit, stay, pay dogs. Your sit, stay, pay dogs have figured out that sitting is the desired response to get the reinforcement and the reinforcement doesn't necessarily come from the stimulus, the reinforcement comes from the handler, the third party. That makes you or the handler or the trainer instrumental in the conditioning, and that's what makes it instrumental conditioning. It's like operant, con it's operant conditioning's less fun cousin because the magic, the magic is gone. The dog understands where the re where the reinforcement's coming from, and they just go to work about it. Doesn't mean they have any less fun but they now know that the reinforcement's coming directly from outside of the environment. So when we talk about search motivators, we're talking about uh, things that directly affect the dog's ability or willingness to search. And Andy can talk to, I'm sure he'll speak to this, in the operational environment, we have to make sure these dogs are motivated. Have to have, especially in the TSA, these dogs work long days. Um, the pay's not great. The medical's good, but the pay's not great for dogs. It's about a tennis ball a day, right? But we want to make sure their motivation is, is high. We want to maintain, we may, they still have a high desire for that primary reward, that function, whatever, be it food or a tennis ball or a Kong or a squeaky, whatever we're throwing at that dog when they find the desired stimulus, we want to make sure they actually want it. Uh, again, we're going to continually train and, and let them know that, hey, the harder you work, the more likely you are to find something, you're going to get reinforced. So the more they find what we call CETA, which is our fancy name for a canine explosive training aid, the more consistently they find explosives, the more they're gonna get paid. And so we just make sure that they have the opportunity to do that through training, uh, be it other, either in the operational or practice environment. Meaningful and appropriate praise. You know, everybody has, has praised a dog in their life. We all talk to them, they're like their babies. I don't know why, but they absolutely love it. It's a way of life for us and it's something we're good at and we use it. It's another thing we manipulate It's part of that socialization. But we don't wanna provide constant praise because then it becomes white noise. It just becomes background noise and it doesn't mean anything to the dog. You can tell, if you tell them they're a good boy 892 times a day, eventually they're, they're just not gonna believe it and they won't, they won't listen to it. The most crucial task we ask of a handler when they leave our course is understanding the canine's normal search behavior and that change of behavior. Uh, if you noticed on Dr. Otto's video, you could see kind of a proprioceptional shift. Tails were wagging, heads were up, ears went back, ears went down. Each dog is different, but when they detect that target stimulus, if they're truly conditioned, they will elicit some kind of physiological response, some sort of reflex. Hey, what's that? You know, like Dr. Otto made a really great analogy. They smell the way we see color. Well, if you're searching for a particular color, if you're playing Where's Waldo, when you see Waldo, something's going to happen you're going to have a reaction. And that's that reaction we're encouraging these handlers to look for is that change of behavior, right? Oh, there it is. And then they start to look even harder. Oh, there's red over here. Waldo wears red. Let me look a little bit harder. So our, we, like, we like our handlers to notice what our dogs are doing in the work environment. And the way we do that is through communication and training. We put out training aids. We allow the dog to encounter the odor. We tell the handler, hey, you see that? You see the tail move? Did you see the ears switch? Did you see the dog turn his head? This dog is processing. That processing is because he's encountered target stimulus. And we do that in known training scenarios. We'll put the training aids out, let the handler know where the training aids are, and then observe the dog's behavior. Uh, and lastly, we do a lot of videotape. I'm pretty sure the only agency does more videotape than us is the NFL, and they get paid a lot more than we do, but it's just as crucial because we play every day, not just on Sundays. And so that's pretty much uh, the work of a, of a dog trainer here in a nutshell as far as putting a team together and how we manipulate dogs into getting what we want from them. Mm -hmm.